Happy Father's Day to you guys. I am excited about today. And uh, man, when I think about being a father, I think about the times I failed, the times that I blew it. There were a couple times with my boys and probably more than a couple if you ask them, but there were a couple times that just stand out in my mind. And I don't know if you dads have the same kinds of thoughts, but where you look back and you're like, man, there were really important things, really important decisions, really important conversations. And I just, in that moment, I blew it. And, you know, one of the things that occurred to me is that one of the best gifts that I could do, especially as my oldest son is a father now, and I think my younger son at some point will be, is to uh, talk to them and to say, hey, remember those times when I blew it and pointed them out specifically? And I asked forgiveness and said, listen, I'm really sorry that I did that. You know, it wasn't my intention to blow it, but I did. And this is how, and this is what I want you to do different as a dad, because being a dad is really hard. Being a man of God is really hard. Being a person of God is really hard. It keeps us humble. It keeps us dependent. And uh, I identify with the failures of uh, those Uh, fathers that we read about in scripture and also some of the successes. And today we're going to read about and talk about a man who was a good king, um, wasn't a great father. Um, His his, uh, being a husband or a spouse was case by case, but somehow God still called him a man after his own heart. And you know that life is never a straight line that we live a life that it zigs and it zags. It takes us left, it takes us right, it takes us up, it takes us down. But all of our lives are supposed to have a trajectory. And my question is, is your trajectory, the trajectory of your heart, is it pointed toward the Lord? Because that is what defines a person who has a heart after God. Now, if you're a woman, a female, this still applies to you 100%. I'm talking to men today because it's Father's Day. And I've entitled the message today, Strong Man, Soft Heart, because that's what I want all of us to be. I want us to be strong men, men of principle, men of character, men who will stand up for those who may not be able to stand up for themselves, people who have backbone and grit, but I want us to have soft hearts that are filled with compassion, that are overflowing with grace, and that we're known for our love. And those two things can coexist. It's what the Holy Spirit does within us as we grow. And he does that to both men and women. But today we're going to focus on King David. He's a man. The principles apply to both men and women. So follow along with me. We're going to look at his life and how in the world could he be called a person whose heart was after God. In Acts 13, 22, we read the apostle Paul talking about King David long after David's life was over, but talking about him and what he was called even before all of the events of him being a king for for several decades um, before that even began. And so the apostle Paul in Acts 13, 22 says, after removing Saul, God made David king and he testified concerning him. Now, I wanna give you a little Bible lesson real quick. So uh, Saul was a king that was um, not a great guy. The children of Israel were led by a period of judges. There was a priest who had some corrupt sons. He appointed his sons as judges. Things got bad. What was said about them at this particular time was they were a people whose hearts were a far away from God. They had drifted far away from the Lord. And um, Saul had become king. He wasn't supposed to be king because God didn't want the children of Israel to have a king. They said, we want a king because the cool kids have a king. We want a king king because the other nations have a king. We want a king because they have a king and we don't have a king and we look kind of dumb. So we want one. And God said, all right, you want one, choose one. So they picked a king based on superficial things, on looks, on their ability to speak, on how well they polled, you know, as far as the, uh, you know, figuring out what the people think, the popular vote. They picked a man named Saul who started off okay, but he did not have a heart after God. And after 40 years of Saul's rule, there came a battle that was the defining moment in his life where they were fighting a group of people called the Amalekites. And God had said that they were such an evil people that they all needed to be killed. This was an Old Testament economy. God deals with us and with nations differently now this side of Jesus, but God's proclamation was that all the Amalekites needed to be killed and that King Agog needed to be destroyed and that nothing could be kept back. The whole nation wiped off the face of the earth. And Saul said, all right, I got it, God. But he didn't got it. He decided to help God a little bit. 
maybe you've been there, I know I have. And he thought, maybe God doesn't really mean what he says. Maybe he means most of what he said. Maybe I can adjust what he said, his command. Maybe it can benefit us both. Maybe I can suit myself and suit God. So they had the war, the children of Israel won, but Saul kept some of the treasure from this rich nation, the Amalekites. He left King Agog alive and God said, enough. And so God removed Saul. Now, you know, if you've studied your Bible, that Saul died a terrible death in a battle against the Philistines. David was chosen to be king, anointed by Samuel before Saul was dead. When God removed him, he made David their king. God testified concerning David and he said, I have found David, the most unlikely son of Jesse, the one that was forgotten way off in the pasture. When Samuel came to Jesse and said, God's told me one of your sons is gonna be king. Jesse brought all of his good sons out. Now, David wasn't a bad son. He was just the last son. He was the forgotten son. Anybody a, a youngest child here? You ever feel like you're the forgotten child, right? Like your parents remember everybody else? I'm not, I'm the oldest, so we forgot my sister. That's the way that it worked, my youngest sister. We, we actually didn't, but I know she felt like that sometimes. Well, David was way, way off in the, in the fields tending the sheep, and Jesse parades in all of his sons, and they were each evaluated, and from one to the other, not that one, not that one, not that one, not that one. And he's like, look, do you have any other sons? And he's like, well, I just got this young one, but I'll call him. So out came David from the, from the pasture, and he was anointed to be king, unlikely. And God said something about David that contrasts to what we learned about Saul. And that is that David, son of Jesse, was a man after God's own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. In contrast to Saul, who did what he wanted to do and blamed it on God. Now, there were three reasons why I think God chose David. Number one is he had chosen to point his heart toward the Lord. What it means when it's said about a person that they have a heart after God, it means that their heart is pointed in a Godward direction, that the trajectory of their life, even though our life moves from side to side and up and down, success and failure, that in general, we are pointed toward the Lord. And he had chosen from an early age, this is the man I'm gonna be no matter what it takes, as long as it takes. Because second, he had decided that he wanted what God wanted more than even what he wanted. He was willing to serve and did not demand to be served by anyone. And because of this humility and this desire to be committed to the Lord, he was selected to be king. Now, this may seem a little overwhelming to you because you know David's life. You ever know somebody a little too well? and you hear really good things about them, and you're like, <laughs> I know the rest of the story and I can't tell you because then it would be gossip as we've learned in church, right? But you just know, you're like, I hear you talking about all this stuff, but I know the rest of the story. And we've read more about David's life than most people in scripture. More of the space in the Old Testament was given to him than, than anyone else. So we know the good, we know the bad, we know the ugly. In the Psalms, which he wrote probably half of, he pours his emotions and his heart out. And you're like, we know this dude. He's not a man whose heart was pointed in a Godward direction. Do you know the times he failed? But yet God still called him that. And one of the most interesting things is that in the Psalms, we are told that David was a man who in his heart had integrity. Now I want you to be called a person of integrity. I want you to be called a man or a woman after God's own heart, a strong man, a strong woman with a soft heart filled with integrity. And you can read along in your notes because I have each of the scriptures in your notes. And you can, if you don't have a Bible app, you can download the NIV app. You can Google them and biblegateway.com will bring them up for you. I encourage you to read because there's so much, so many references in this story. But when you look at David's life and he was called a man of integrity, Integrity is being the same as you are when someone's looking 
as you are when no one's looking. Being the same person you are in public as you are in private. Acting the same way in private as you would if there was somebody standing there watching you. A man who said, I'm gonna be who I say I am. And if I'm not, I'm gonna own it. What a great thing to be said about a dad. I have a dad of integrity and he wanted to have kids with integrity. But it took me being blessed with the model of a dad who had integrity to be able to see what that looked like in a life and begin to try to emulate that and make decisions in the right way. Some of you haven't had that same opportunity. And so we have the examples to follow from scripture and other examples in our life that show us even what this looks like. Wouldn't it be great for God to say about you, you're a person after my heart. I trust you to do exactly what I want you to do. You are a person who in private does the same things as you do in public. What a powerful testimony. But we know David and we can't reconcile it because he just seems to all over the place. I mean, God's describing a super Christian, somebody whose feet don't even touch the ground when they walk, whose Bible hovers above the desk, right? I mean, someone that's just so out of touch that we can't relate, but that's not the man we read about. And I wanna talk to you about some excerpts from his life very quickly in this first section of my teaching. And then when we come back, I'm gonna give you the three keys that kept him on course as he finished his life well as a man after God's own heart. David, after being tapped to be king, and you know the story if you've read about David, had an opportunity to show himself in battle at a very young age. He went to check on his brothers. He was even too young to fight. And there was a giant named Goliath who was fighting for the Philistines. And when he got to the front lines, you know, David, this nobody, this shepherd boy who someone had said, you're gonna be king one day, but he still hadn't figured out what all that meant. He looked at his brothers and the soldiers and he said, why do you let this giant cuss out our God? And they said, well, we're letting him cuss out our God because he's bigger than we are, right? We're not gonna fight him. I mean, if we fight him, we're gonna lose our heads. And so we're just gonna let him cuss. And David's like, well, I'm not gonna let him cuss out our God. And they said, how are you gonna stop him, little fella? And David said, I might be little and I might not yet be a proven warrior, although the Bible says he was able to acquit himself well. He said, I have been fighting the lions. I've been fighting the bears and God has protected me every time. And so I have decided to trust the Lord, I'll fight. They tried on some armor that was way too big for him. He said, I don't wanna wear the armor, it's just not me. Grabbed a sling, took off running down the hill toward the giant, sunk a stone in his head, the giant died. The giant lost his head, Goliath, and David became popular. Women sang songs in the street. Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his 10,000s. And Saul said, hey, you got potential, son. Come and serve in my court. So David was on the, the up and up. Things were looking good. Well, Saul became jealous of David, as you might expect. And um, the jealousy was causing a lot of tension. But in the meantime, some things happened in David's life. Number one, he got married. And what Saul had done was he had offered his daughter her name was Michael, to anyone who would kill Goliath. What a prize. She turned out not to be. But David got married. He got a best friend, and that was a really good thing. David was learning that as you follow God, you cannot travel alone, that no man or woman is intended to live in isolation, that you should choose a running partner in addition to a spouse, a friend who's trusted. You shouldn't settle for acceptance, just whoever wants to hang out, but you look for excellence, somebody who shares the same values that you do, wants to live the same kind of life that you do, who's willing to hold you accountable and to be accountable, who's committed to you. And he connected with Saul's son, Jonathan, and they begin to serve the Lord together because their value was the same. They'd chosen to be men of God. They wanted what God wanted more than even what they wanted for themselves and for each other. 
and they were willing to do whatever it took for as long as it took to accomplish God's purpose. But all of a sudden, in Saul's jealousy, David's life fell apart. In a period of days, he lost his job. Can anybody relate to that? He lost his wife, who at first stood by him and helped him escape her father, Saul. But then when it got tough, she turned her back on David and said, David made me do it. He threatened to kill me and she abandoned him. He lost his best friend. Not forever, but they were no longer able to do life together. And he even lost his self-respect, his dignity. He was in exile, connecting with a bunch of outlaws trying to preserve his life, hiding in caves, wondering where in the world God was, but never turning his back. I'll do whatever it takes for as long as it takes to serve the Lord. And for David, it must have seemed like a long, long time. Well, eventually in 1 Samuel 28 and 29, we learned that David became king. He won some great battles. He was elevated to a place of honor. He got rich. He was famous and he served the Lord. And then one day he was hanging out on his roof and looked out across the neighborhood and saw a woman who didn't have any clothes on. And the Bible said she was a hottie. Instead of turning and looking the other way, like a gentleman, a man of God would do, instead of taking Job's advice from Job 31.1, where he says, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look at a woman with lust. He looked, his look became a linger, his linger became a desire, his desire became an action and he had an affair with her. The affair was covered up with a murder, with a sickness of the heart, a, a grief that lasted for Ever, it seemed like, even though it was just months and months. The consequences of the sin cost him a child, cost him some respect. And you say, how would a man after God's own heart fail? Well, as we see over and over again in the Old Testament, failure is an event, not a person. And even though he had sinned in a way that God didn't desire. He did what God desired, which was he owned it. He confessed it. He brushed himself off and he said, man, that was awful. But I'm gonna live a different way. And so he led for a while and God blessed him and he won some battles. And things look good. And if you read about David, one of the things you read is that his parenting skills weren't the best. He had a whole bunch of practice kids and then he had a really good one at the end that you know he ended up getting right. But one of his kids turned his back on David. It was first just treachery, deception, his son trying to kind of sneak in and take the popularity away from the dad. He soon rallied an army, was involved in a coup and wanted to kill his own father and destroy every person who identified with King David. And David face to face with the prospect of having to kill his own son chose to flee Jerusalem. Absalom was killed in a battle and David grieved his heart broke and life went on. And all of this time through the ups and the downs and the backs and the forths, this is still a man who God said he could trust to do exactly what he wanted him to do, that he was a man after his own heart. All of this time, in some way, his heart was still pointed toward God. Now, not only does that give me great hope, but it challenges me to my core. And you and I are gonna talk about the three things that kept David, that will keep you and I pointed in that direction.
and able to live a powerful life as strong men and women with compassionate and soft hearts. Let's pray. That was worth sticking around for, wasn't it? How many of you play golf? Anybody in here play golf? All right, uh, I'm not gonna ask you to demonstrate. I just wanna know how many of you play golf. I need to find out if my illustration is gonna connect my story or if it's just gonna miss right over the top. It's Father's Day, so we can talk about, um, we can talk about golf. Thank you, by the way, for not being on the golf course right now. Um, because you're here and you can hear this and I think it's important for you to hear. Um, I play golf, but I don't play well. And that may not surprise you. Um, I try to play well. I played this last week with some friends from church and um, you know, I was doing really well uh, through 16 holes. Um, probably the best round I've had in a long time, which I'm not gonna tell you what it is, none of your business. Um, wasn't great for some people, but for me, it was really good. And, and you know, in golf, the goal is that when you hit the ball off the tee, that you uh, hit the fairway. And on the fairway, on your second shot usually, uh, your goal is to hit the green. And when you're on the green, your goal is to putt. And you'd like to one putt where it goes in the hole, ideally. But if you're on the green, you don't wanna putt more than twice. And so your intentions are, you know, that you play well. That's not usually or often what happens to me when I go out and, and play golf. And I was playing with the three other friends and, you know, they're keeping score and it's not important who wins unless you win, then it's important. And if they win, it's not important. So it wasn't important who won this last week when I was playing with my friends, but I get up to hole number 17 and uh, I tee it up to par five. And I'm like, man, I'm gonna smoke this drive. I had a great round going and I hit a ball that was straight right into the trees. We couldn't find it. My buddy Travis back there's laughing because he was helping me try to find the ball. We gave up and said, we offered this one to the tree gods. We're gonna move on. And, um, and I took a penalty stroke. And I thought, man, that was really bad. I wish that hadn't happened. And, you know, and so we're trying to figure out why it happened. The excuse is, or the explanation is, I'm just not very good at golf. So I drop another ball, I pull out a two iron. I'm gonna take it all the way to the green with my two iron off the fairway. So I mean, I smack the ball and I had a great fade, which I meant to do, but what I didn't mean to do was hit it across the fairway into the trees and lose another ball. So in two holes or in two strokes on the same hole, I lost two balls, so I have two penalty strokes. The next shot, I'm gonna make the green one putt, you know, and save the hole. So instead of hitting a great pitching wedge, I hit a terrible pitching wedge about 35 yards instead of the distance that I was intending to, and then finally made it to the green. Triple bogeyed that hole, ended up with three extra strokes. I was so mad that on the 18th hole, I didn't even know what I was doing and I ended up with a double bogey and I threw the round away entirely. And a lot of life and spiritual life is like golf. We have good intentions and we want to hit the fairway. We wanna put the ball on the green, but sometimes we tee it up and we hit it into the woods. We don't mean to, we do. And we find that we've lost a ball. And so you have to choose what you're gonna do at that point. Now, some people break their clubs and throw them into the lake and say, I'm never gonna play again. Well, spiritually, some people do the same thing. I failed and so I'm gonna break my clubs, throw them into the lake and I'm just gonna quit trying or you can drop another ball and try again. And if you hit it into the woods again, you have to choose, what am I gonna do? Well, I'm gonna drop a ball and I'm gonna try again. And I'm gonna keep trying until I get it right, because that's what a man of God does. When you fail, you dust yourself off, you confess your sin, and you keep your heart pointed toward the Lord. And David, explains three things that I think were his secret weapons, the way he kept the compass of his heart pointed toward true north. And he had made a commitment early in his life that he was gonna be a man of God, period. He loved the Lord. And he said, I'm a guy who's gonna love the Lord. I'm a woman, if you're a woman, who's going to love the Lord. Life is not gonna be a straight line. There's gonna be ups and downs. David lost his job, his wife, his best friend and his dignity in about two days time. His own kids, when they weren't murdering each other, were trying to murder him. Had failed morally. Backed it up with one of the big no-nos, the biggest one no-no in the Bible, murder. But yet somehow he kept his commitment to be a man of God. He had decided, I love the Lord. 
in the Psalms, we read about his desire to serve the Lord. And I'm reading this out of the message paraphrase. In your notes, you have the NIV translation, which is much more accurate according to the original language. But for our purposes, I want to read it from the message. He says, God, you're my God. Now, this is important right here. God, you are my God. I am not my God. My family is not my God. My job is not my God. My hobbies are not my God. My money is not my God. God, you are my God. What he doesn't say is so important. I can't get enough of you. I've worked up such a hunger and thirst for God, traveling across dry and weary times in my life where God may have seemed distant. And he might have wanted to quit and to give up. So here I am in the place of worship. My eyes are open, drinking in your strength and glory, in your generous love. I'm really living at last because he has solved, he's found the secret to the power and the point of life. God, you are my God, even through the worst of times. In your generous love, I'm finally living. My lips brim praises like fountains. I bless you every time I take a breath. My arms wave like banners of praise to you. Now, you and I can't write like that, right? I mean, he was a poet. He was a warrior poet, a true Renaissance man. Interesting guy. If you could sit down and hang out and have a cup of coffee with him, it would be amazing. Somebody that could write like that from his heart in words that most guys we can't find, but you know what he's thinking. And in, in general, to sum it up, I just want to point you to the fact that there is a difference between being a Christian man and being a man who really follows Christ. And there are lots of men who say that they're Christian, but following Christ is very, well, they have very little interest in it because following Christ means pursuing Christ and forsaking everything else. To be able to say, God, you are my God, which means you are more important than my career. Even though I love my family, you are number one. My hobbies, they fall behind you. My bank account, it belongs to you. My legacy, whatever I leave, it's yours. You are my God. And there's a difference in a person saying, yeah, I'm a Christian. We're a Christian family. Or being a family who genuinely follows Christ. And he made the decision just like you and I can. And many have made that decision. And you've seen examples of it today in our baptistry. Well, the second thing that he did is he didn't just decide that he was going to love the Lord. He decided that he was going to love God's word. Any relationship takes communication. <laughs> and again, for many of you guys out there, if you're in a relationship, you probably hear that a lot and you don't like to hear it because a lot of times we guys, we don't like to communicate, but it's the words that are exchanged that create the intimacy that we desire in a relationship. And if we don't talk to our spouse, if we don't talk to a girlfriend, if you're a lady, a boyfriend or a husband, uh, if you, you have a friend, you can't have a relationship without communication. You can't guess what people are thinking. You can't guess what God is thinking. And God has communicated who he is and what he wants. The way that we're supposed to live our lives through his word. And we have to commit that not only are we going to love the Lord, but we're going to love the Lord's word, which means that we have to take it that's out here and figure out a way to get it in here so that the Holy Spirit can begin to do things. Like we're told in the Bible, if you hide the word in your heart, what? You're not going to sin against God. Like Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own word, your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge his word and his plan. And then he will direct your paths, even if they lead through the desert, even if they lead through joblessness, even if they lead through divorce, even if they lead through a loss of dignity or a loss of friendship, even if they lead through family dysfunction, he'll direct your path. And in the end, your life will be built on a foundation that never shifts, it never changes. And David made a decision that to keep my heart pointed true north, I'm gonna love the Lord and I'm gonna love his word. Now, finally, and this is interesting, and I'm not just saying this because I'm a pastor. 
I'm saying this because it's repeated in scripture over and over again. And this is David who's talking, not me. I didn't put it in there. He made a commitment that he was gonna love God, that he was gonna love God's word and that he was also gonna love God's church. He says, I rejoice with those who say, let's go to the house of the Lord. I rejoice with those who say, let's go to the house of the Lord. And in your notes in the Psalms, you can read that. He doesn't say, I rejoice with those who say, today I'm gonna sleep in and next week I'm gonna go to church. He doesn't say, I'm gonna rejoice with those who say, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't really have to go to church. He says, and I believe you're gonna find it in Psalm 22. It's not up on the screen for some reason. Psalm 122, one, maybe it's 123, one. I'm getting old. My memory doesn't always remember everything specifically. I will rejoice with those who say, let's go to the house of the Lord. He knew that there was something important and something powerful about the habit of meeting together with other believers. In his life, there were other practicing Jews. In our lives, they're Christians. And that he knew that when he pulled himself away from that, he was not the man that God wanted him to be. God created us to live in a herd. That's just the way it is, a herd. Christianity, our walk with God is personal, but it's not private. And David knew these things. And so remember, before he had this life of ups and downs and backs and forths and twists and turns, he was chosen and selected. King Saul put out to pasture. David, son of Jesse, here is a man whose heart is pointed toward me, a man I can trust to do exactly what I tell him to do. And when David ended his life, and you can read this for yourself, and I hope you do, you can download the NIV Bible app, as I said before, or biblegateway.com will take you to any scripture that you want in any translation that you want. But at the end of David's life, we see that he finished well. In Acts chapter 13, we're told that King David had served his generation well, and that after he served his generation well, he died. And after he died, the worms ate his body, his body decayed. But before he died, he did four things. The first thing was, he reflected on what he wasn't able to do in his life. Now, I don't know how many of you feel old. I'm 54 and I'm starting to get it. Now, some of you guys who've been a little further down the road than me, you know, you're just a youngster, right? I'm starting to get it, right? I'm starting to wake up in the morning wondering what I did yesterday to hurt myself and then realizing I didn't do anything. Sometimes you just hurt, right? It just, it just happens. And I'm starting to see. The end, I don't think, is near, but I can see it, right? I mean, it, it's, it's out there. When you're 25, you think you're going to live forever. When you're 54, eh, you know, the reality is you don't have that much longer. And if you think about your life, the last thing that you want to do at the end of your life, whether you're a man or a woman, is to look back on your life in reflection and have that be filled with regret. And the one thing David wanted to do is to build the temple for God. And the one thing God said you can't do, David, because of the consequences of your sin, is build my temple. And so as David processed this, he did not allow the reflection to become regret, but instead he thanked God for the things that God allowed him to do and realized that what he wanted so badly for himself, now his son was going to be able to do. It was the kid he got right. The kid that after all of his practice kids that he finally had made an impact within, Solomon. And the second thing he did before he died is he met with Solomon. And in a sense, this is what he said. And dads, this is so important. Solomon, I want you to be a better man than me. I want your life to be blessed. I want you to be more obedient. I want you to be a better Christian. In every way, I want you to be better than me. That's what I want for my kids. It's what Pastor Dan wants for his. It's what all of our staff, it's our prayer. That our kids, they get it quicker and better than even we did. 
And David pulls Solomon close to him. And he says, in you, my son, Solomon, acknowledge the God of your father. You saw the good and you saw the bad, but you know my heart. When I was wrong, I owned it and I confessed. When I was right, I thanked God because he gave me the ability. He put the people in my life, the circumstances he arranged. You know the God of your father. Serve him with a whole heart, with wholehearted devotion. And man, we could spend time breaking this word down, but we don't have the time. And with a willing mind, for here it is, Solomon, a father passes to his son. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and every thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. What a powerful, powerful word for a parent to give to a kid. And man, you want him to get it so bad. And David was about to die. He was passing on his legacy, his dream to his son. Well, the next thing David does, the third thing, and there are only four, so don't be alarmed, just two more, is he prayed. And the first thing he did when he prayed is he thanked God. I encourage you, read this yourself because it is such a fascinating and heartfelt prayer. But he thanked God. God, you've given me a great life. You have been faithful to me even when I haven't been faithful to you. You honored my commitment to love you and to have my heart pointed towards you. Even though if I were you, I might not have. Again, my paraphrase, read this for yourself and come up with your own. And then after thanking God for the life that God allowed him to live, he prayed for his people who needed direction and guidance and needed the Lord. And he said, I've been trying to help them, but I can't anymore. I'm old, I'm dying. So you take care of them, God. And then what do you think the fourth thing is that he did? He went to church. You don't believe me? Read it yourself. What we do here is more than important. It's necessary for us to be men and women with strong character and soft hearts. He rejoiced with the assembly. First Chronicles 29 tells us that. And um, then he died. And once again, in Acts 13, 36, David had served his generation, God's purpose, whole generation. He fell asleep, which means he died. He was buried with his ancestors, who cares? And his body decayed. Now the body decayed part sounds morbid, but Paul was comparing that to Jesus who died, rose again, and his body never decayed. So in context, it makes sense. So my question to you as we end is, what is it that you want? What's the one thing that you'd ask for from the Lord? I want this kind of heart. And you never end up close to God accidentally. Ever. There's no intimacy with God without intentionality on your part. And the beautiful thing is all we have to do is we've said over and over and over and over and over again since January of this year is you just got to put yourself in motion. Just put some things in your life, right? That allow you to collide with the Holy Spirit of God. And as you do that, God will in you change you and create in you something that surprises you, but is useful for his purpose and great for the people around you. So will you be a man or woman whose heart keeps moving toward the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the time we've spent. And I thank you for the example of David in this short survey of his life. My goodness, it's so brief, Father, that we've left out so much, but we get the point. Not a perfect man, but he kept teeing it up. Boy, did he hit it into the woods more than once, but he kept teeing it up, owning his mistakes, confessing to you, checking his heart, recommitting his desire. He wanted what you want more than what he wanted and he was willing to do whatever it took. That's what I want. That's what I want for my friends here. That's what I want our church to be known for. In humility and with dependence, I ask you to create that in us for your glory and yours alone. Thank you for being a heavenly father who's the perfect example of agape love. And I thank you for all the fathers who are here and those who are hearing my voice. And I pray that you would bless them in a special way. 
Give them endurance and strength. Give them the patience that they need. The wisdom and the words to be able to speak life and hope and truth into their kids and to others that they come in contact with. Protect their heart as they make the commitment to be men whose hearts are pointed in your direction. Keep them from distraction, keep them from deception, ultimately from destruction. I pray, Father, that you would be honored in the way that we live. And I thank you for your strength and for your guidance and your direction. I pray these things with confidence because of who Jesus is, not because of who I am or we are, but because of you. In Jesus' name, amen.